Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is TJ, and uh, I've decided that I now realize that I qualify for every 12-step program imaginable. I used, to, I used to actually say that I didn't qualify for gamble, Gamblers Anonymous because I've never gambled, and then my life experience sober has shown me that I did some very high-risk behavior that landed me in a really dark place, and I'm going to hopefully get into that. Um, I want to begin by offering a quote from Bill Wilson. At least, I'm not sure if this is actually a quote from Bill Wilson, but at an international conference, I think it was 10 years ago, an old-timer said it was, and I told Lee that um, Bill Wilson signed my big book, and she believed me for a moment, and, and, and I said, I'm, not, I'm actually not that old, but I did do it in a way that, I, that maybe, maybe he did, I don't know. But here it is from Bill Wilson. AA is not a success story, but a story of human failure transformed, transformed into usefulness by the alchemy of a loving God. And I want to say it again, because when I heard that at that conference some years back, it struck me to the core. AA is not a success story, but a story of human failure transformed into usefulness by the alchemy of a loving God. And I'm struck by the knowing that there are thousands of ways to tell a story. And I like to begin, when I I talk, I like to begin by setting an intention, not for anybody else, but for myself. And that intention is simply that I be vulnerable and authentic. I'm also, I also know that I don't have to give details. I don't have to give my fourth step up here. And I also know that it may be what I need to do in order to stay sober today. So I am absolutely willing. There's a part of me, there's always, I I really have come to believe that there's a part of me that wants to recover and a part of me that wants to stay in fear or in separation. And that part of me that wants to recover today knows that I may have to say things and tell you parts of my story that I'd rather not talk about. And it's not the part of when I was drinking and using. It's the decisions that I made based on fear in long-term sobriety that landed me in some really dark places. And what I've come to understand in the principle that no matter how far down the scale we have gone, I will see how my benefit, my experience can benefit others is far more about those things that I've done in recovery than those things that I have done when I was drinking and using. I got sober when I was 20 in June of 1986. And like Gina's story, I really relate to the fact that I've grown up in Alcoholics Anonymous and I have done all kinds of things that I wish I could say it was alcohol's fault or drugs' fault, but I was stark raving sober, doing all kinds of crazy behavior. And I want to say that I'm absolutely, profoundly grateful for those experiences because they have actually brought me to a place of usefulness. And so I know that what I'm here to do today is to share with you what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. And the truth is, I would absolutely much rather talk about what it was like, what happened, and what it is like now. And in truth, I only have my perception of what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. And I recognize that that is the important piece, actually. I remember when I was first doing my first fourth step, I was calling my sisters, and I was calling my mother, and I was asking them for details about what happened in particular eras of my life. And what struck me is my mother and my two sisters had incredibly different stories or incredibly different versions of what happened. And it occurred to me that it actually doesn't really matter what happened. What matters is what I decided about what happened, what I believed about myself and the world. I was a really, really happy child. My mother told me that she had never seen a child laugh so much and be so filled with joy. And then something happened to me around age seven. And what happened is I decided that the world was not safe. 
I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting at my dining room table and my two sisters and my mother were there. My dad was not there. Surprise, surprise, part of my story. I remember a physical sensation of closing off and shutting down. I remember for the first time experiencing fear. And I want to thank Lisa on Friday night for speaking of recovery about coming back to the truth of who we are when we're small children. And when I look into the eyes of a one-year-old and see joy and bliss, I recognize that that's the truth of who I am. And then life happens. I have a, a friend that used to share that he had the happiest life he's ever had, and then he went to kindergarten, and everything changed. <laughs> and I absolutely relate to that. I remember, I remember going to kindergarten, and I remember sitting in the back of the room being absolutely terrified. And early on, thinking that everyone knew what they were doing, and I did not. It started with, I don't know if it started with, but one story I have is it started with me learning how to tie my shoes, and I'm left-handed, and I actually could not learn how to tie my shoes because they were teaching me right-handed, and they sent me home with the board with the two shoes on it, and I was like, oh, God, this is the not-so-smart board. I remember that one decision I made is that everyone was smarter than I am. That decision actually plagued me until I was 20 years sober. I made the fundamental decision that I was stupid. I went, I went home, I studied, I learned how to tie my shoes right-handed. I went back to school. Lo and behold, I couldn't do it in front of everyone. I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm a failure. I look at a five-year-old now, I look at a six-year-old, I look at a seven-year-old, and I can't imagine that they are making major life decisions about the world. But what I decided was the world was not safe, and I closed off. And I walked around with that feeling of being closed off and separate from age seven until age 13 when I got discovered alcohol. I want to stand up here and say a big thank you to drugs and alcohol for saving my life. Because without drugs and alcohol, I don't think I would be standing here. I want to back up a little and talk some about what was happening in my home growing up. One of the greatest gifts I've received about being so and being sober a little while is that it no long it actually no, does not matter to me if alcoholism is a disease. What causes it? Is it? Nature, is it nurture? It, it, it really, it, it's, it's much less relevant to me today. What's relevant to me today is what I need to do to practice the theme, which is living in the now. I want to thank the conference for, for having that as the theme. What was going on in my house growing up is my mother was incredibly depressed or rageful, and my father was nowhere to be seen. My father had some interest in some um, ladies other than my mother. And we had to move away from a small town, um, kind of in the middle of the night. He was a school teacher. You can kind of fill in the blank there. I didn't know any of that was happening, but what I did know was that something felt... Actually, what I, what I recognize now in my perspective of my story is that it was the first time that I experienced shame that there was something wrong with me, there was something wrong with us. I don't know what causes alcoholism. I don't know if it was the abuse I suffered, the neglect I suffered, the feeling of less than, the feeling of separate from. But what I do know is by age 13, when I had that first drink of alcohol, it was the most amazing moment of my entire life. Not because I felt taller or smarter or better. It didn't matter. All those feelings of being other than, separate from, those feelings of shame, for a moment, there was relief from that. And if alcohol continued to work that way, I absolutely would still be doing it. There is no doubt in my life, in my mind, that that is true. As many people say, you know, alcohol was fun, and then it was fun with problems, and then it was problems. And I just want to fast forward to my last year of using. 
I discovered in June of 1985, I discovered ecstasy. I lived in Dallas and I was going to this club that it was actually is the, literally the birthplace of ecstasy. It is where a psychiatrist brought it to the club in 1983 and 84 and it was legal and that's where ecstasy started. So I am a guinea pig for all things ecstasy because from June of 1985 until June of 1986 when I got sober, every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, I used as much ecstasy as I possibly could. I drank as much as I possibly could. I did not eat or drink on Thursday, or I'm sorry, eat or sleep. I did drink. Lots of drinking. <laughs> Probably no water. I thought it was really cool to be tragic. I, I'm, 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 I'm about six feet tall. Um, I was 155 pounds at the time, and by, by Sunday evening, I was always at 145. I thought that was super cool that I'd lost 10 pounds. It was the beginning, you know, it was the eyeliner, black eyeliner era. I want to speak to part of my story. At a very early age, I decided, as I said, that the world was not safe. And I also decided that something outside of me must be able to fix that. And so drugs, alcohol, relationships, all of those things that I grabbed outside of myself to make myself feel better became an addiction. The last year of my using was an absolute low-level search for God. I was spiritually bankrupt in every way, had no tools to do anything other than do it all again. I had a therapist, and I would go to therapy on Wednesday, and I would talk with her about all my communication issues and my difficulties in relationships, but I would never mention the five, six, or seven hits of ecstasy I had taken the previous weekend. I never mentioned the not eating or sleeping. I never mentioned all of the stealing that I was doing. And believe me, stealing is a big part of my story. I had a very, very early fascination with taking things that weren't mine. The first time I ever stole anything, I was seven years old, and my sister and her friend said, well, you go to Kmart with us. Very, very, you know. Yeah. <laughs> They had a code, they would say, I, I, and it was the 70s, and they would say, these are dynamite, and they, would be, they were earrings, or they were, and I would steal them. And they would love me. And that's kind of how my life continued. I had a knowing or an idea or a belief that I was broken, and if I was broken, something outside of me would be able to fix me and if I could steal for you, you might love me. Now, don't get me wrong. I also stole for myself plenty of times later on. <laughs> In October of 1985, my friend David 12-stepped um, me. I thought he was asking me out on a date. <laughs> His sobriety date is October 21st, and it was on Halloween, and I remember, so he had 10 days sober, and he was at this nightclub, and he was telling me about his new life and about his sobriety and about how incredible his life was. A few key points that I will say is that he didn't tell me it was Alcoholics Anonymous. He told me, I go to these meetings, my life is better, I'm not drinking and using, and then he said he had not had a drink or drug for 10 days. Now, I don't remember that because what I remembered him saying was he had not had a drink in something like a year or something just unbelievable, unfathomable. But I know now it was 10 days, and it's important that I tell that story for one reason. I didn't have a conscious thought about him from Halloween of 1985 until my sobriety date in June of 86, but a seed was planted. I had to go on to do some overdosing and a lot of other crazy things that happened. But in June of 1986, I ran into him again, and I remembered immediately that he had been going to those meetings. Now, keep in mind, it was six months earlier, and I had not had any contact with him. And I remember running up to him and saying, are you still going to those meetings, and can I go to one with you? Now, I also was still hoping on some level it was a date. <laughs> and if you want to know more details about that, I can tell you after the meeting, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I won't bring his story into this. So I walked into 
Alcoholics Anonymous, not knowing exactly where I was going, somewhat hoping I was on a date, but also knowing that his life was different and there was a light in his eyes that I had not seen with the people I had been hanging out with at this club in Dallas, all of us on ecstasy and thinking we were so cool and absolutely dying on the inside. I got sober in Dallas. I got sober in North Dallas. And for anyone who knows Dallas, it's a really wonderful place to be gay if you stay in about five zip codes. <laughs> it really is. It's a really wonderful place to be gay. But there's, there really are about five zip codes to stay in. The group I got sober in was outside of that zip code. <laughs> there were, it felt like 500 people. My guess is it was probably 100. It was a big meeting. It was a Monday night. We had something in Dallas called uh, uh, step speaker meetings. So every Monday for the entire month, the speaker will come and share their experience on like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 throughout the month. My friend Ted V was speaking. I, ha I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. It felt like 500 people. We smoked back then. It was a smoke-filled room. I saw the podium. I kind of looked over at the end. I saw the podium. It had two big A's on it, and it said, Expect a Miracle. And I thought, oh, shit. Where have I landed? I looked around the room, and I saw two or three people that used to hang out with us in the nightclub I went to that I hadn't seen in a while. I find it curious that we spend a lot of time talking about how important it is what we say because the newcomer might need to hear a certain thing. I have no idea what anybody said in that meeting. No idea. I just remember sitting there just frozen, absolutely frozen. But I will say two things that are important. I felt something there that I had not felt in a long time or perhaps ever. I won't say that I felt immediately at home, but I did feel something that felt incredibly different than how I felt on the inside. And the most important thing is my friend Scott, who later became my first sponsor, walked up to me after the meeting. Now, I know that there were, it, it, now that I had stayed sober there and was in, in that group for two years, so I know there were at least one or two other gay people, but I didn't. I thought I was the only gay person in the room, and, and Scott walked up to me, obviously very heterosexual. I was terrified. And he walked up to me and he said, welcome. He said some very, very important things. I think he had a, probably a, maybe a sense I was gay with my you know, hair up and my maybe a little eyeliner left from the nightclub for the, week, the weekend before. He said, you are welcome here just as you are. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Here is my phone number. You can call me anytime. And then he told me the most important, the next most important thing, which is, what are you doing tomorrow evening? I can meet you here at 8 o'clock and take you to another meeting. To obtain additional copies, receive a free catalog of AA and Al-Anon talks, or to find out about our tape and CD of the Month Club, call Encore Audio Archives at 1-800-878-1308 or visit our website at www.12steptapes.com. My second meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous was two days later, it was a young people's meeting, and this was 1986, and it was kind of the, the real, the, the surge of treatment centers, and a lot of young people were being sent to treatment, whether they were alcoholics and addicts or not. And I walked into this room, and there really were 200 people in this room, and I, I was one of the older people in the room at 20, age 14 through 20, and absolutely insane, and the energy was, was incredible and wild. And what a gift to have gotten sober in a time and a place that as a 20-year-old, I could find people that I related to immediately. I want to tell a story that, to me, speaks to what we really do here in Alcoholics Anonymous. As I mentioned, I was outside of the zip code, the safety zone, as I would call it in Dallas. However... Everyone there offered me nothing but unconditional love and acceptance and absolute support. See, I believed that because I was gay, I was different. I believed that people would not relate to me. As a matter of fact, all I was doing is thinking about myself and how different I was than everybody and how they couldn't possibly, what are they thinking about me? And that's, that's something that continues throughout my, my, my recovery and my life is what are you thinking about me? And I've come to understand you're not. <laughs> 
and it, it, literally, it literally took me 24 years of sobriety to recognize that you're not thinking about me. And that has been the greatest gift of my sobriety. There was a man named Wyatt who drank every single night. When I walked into Alco Alcoholics Anonymous, he said, homosexuals are going to burn in the pool of fire. <laughs> and I would say, good to see you too, Wyatt. <laughs> see, everyone there loved me just as I was, and everyone there loved Wyatt just as he was. He drank every night. He came back every day the next day and told me about how homosexuals are going to burn in the pool of fire. I don't know what happened in Wyatt's life, but at one point he was able to get it and stay sober. He had about six months sober, and he said, um, TJ, I need to uh, make some amends to you. Now, I, I was a little concerned because I had been, I, I, one person had made amends to me, and the amends were, you know, I've been calling you a faggot, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly the kind of amends I was looking forward to with Wyatt, but I was, I was convinced that's what I was about to get, and I thought, I know how much pain he is in, and I am willing to sit here and hear his amends. And he pulled me into a room in our AA clubhouse, and he said, my sponsor told me that I need to tell you a part of my story and let you know why I have said those things to you. When I was drinking and using, I was selling my body to men, and I have no idea how to live with that. I know I'm not gay, but I have no idea how to work through the feelings of shame and hopelessness around things that I did that I do not know how to ever get over. I was speaking at the big gay group some weeks later, and his sponsor said, Wyatt, I can tell you how you're going to make amends. You're going to go to that gay group, you're going to sit in the front row, and you're going to stand up and applaud as TJ shares his story. This is the kind of love that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. I moved to San Francisco in 1991, and I've been here, and I've been sober ever since. Living sober has been a huge part of my recovery. I'm so grateful to this conference. I'm so grateful to watch it go through all its different incarnations and the spirit of living sober to stay alive and vibrant. What an incredible weekend this has been. I've literally been blown away by the speakers and the quality of vulnerability and authenticity that they have shown. In 1998, I opened a business. In 1998, I began to lose sight of what was important to me spiritually, and I began to believe that success was what this was about. And what success meant to me at the time was to make as much money as I possibly could and be oh so fabulous again. I believe Mark said it beautifully on Friday night that the things that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me began to take me away from Alcoholics Anonymous. And there was just a subtle trajectory that took me off course, and I woke up one day way over here, feeling one more time spiritually bankrupt and looking so desperately for things outside of myself to fill, fill me up and fix me. I made some decisions based on fear, and there were some major repercussions, and it ended up being a very public thing, and things were written about me in the BAR, and... Um, the, the biz I had a business that collapsed. People were owed money. I went into a huge depression and a huge amount of shame. And shame nearly kept me um, from remembering that I have a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was 20 years sober. I was 40 years old. And I was depressed and laying horizontal on my sofa, thinking that no one could possibly understand what I've gone through. People could not possibly understand the shame that I felt about the way I've harmed people, how I didn't feel that my behavior was appropriate or sober. 
And I want to read something uh, from the 12 and 12, because if you get nothing else from what I share, I intend to read a couple of things out of the 12 and 12 so that we can focus on what is Alcoholics Anonymous. And I just want to give a little bit of a plug for rigidity, because when I, when I, <laughs> when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was absolutely bankrupt and absolutely afraid. And the only thing I knew to do was to go to 10 meetings a week and learn how to quote the book and learn how to sound good and come up with some... I was, I was the person when I had about a year and a half sober, I was the person that secretaried the meeting and after your share, I would say, you might want to read page blah, blah, blah. It might help you with that. <laughs> One more time, the people of Alcoholics Anonymous just loved me. <laughs> But I'll tell you what it did give me is it gave me an understanding of what's in the big book and the 12 and 12 because I was going to do it perfectly. So I learned all the page numbers. So I like to say long, longer term recovery for me is forgetting the page numbers <laughs> and living in not knowing because it was in my belief that I had to have all the answers that kept me separate from you. This is from step seven in the 12 and 12. In AA, we looked and listened. Everywhere, we saw failure and misery transformed by humility into priceless assets. We heard story after story of how humility had brought strength out of weakness. In every case, pain had been the admission price into a new life. That is my story in long, longer-term sobriety. I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous one more time convinced you were all talking about me. And I think you probably were for maybe a week or two. You know, there's that circuit. And then, and then, and then a couple broke up, and then they were the topic. And, you know, it goes on. <laughs> but what I've come to understand is all of those things that I've done, all of those ways that I've harmed others, all those ways I've harmed myself, all those ways I've lived from my false beliefs of separation, fear, not good enough, better than have brought me to a place of being able to be present for another person when going through any of that with far less judgment than I've ever had in my entire life. The end of that story of my business transaction landed me in jail at 20-some years sober. And that's that part I'd rather not actually share. <laughs> What happened for me is the love of Alcoholics Anonymous showed up for me. And another thing that I'm going to speak to is the judgment of Alcoholics Anonymous spoke to, showed up for me, too. There were people that actually said, I, I can't talk to you anymore. And I really thank them. First of all, it was like one person. Everyone else was loving, right? But I'm like, I can't believe. I can't believe they said that. Yeah, it was like one or two people. Everyone else just welcomed me with open and loving arms, and I recognize that it's my own ideas about myself. It's my own shame. It's my own feelings of um, separation that kept me from receiving this priceless gift. So a big part of my story today is this balance, which does not come naturally for me, a balance of being accountable and cleaning up those things I needed to clean up. And believe me, it's a long process, especially financially. It's a process that I'm in that I, I don't necessarily see like this quick fix to, but I know that I can do what I can do each month toward making that restitution. And also, not having the belief that that's the truth of who I am. So I just want to talk about my present day experience because I only have a few minutes left. I'm literally living the life of my dreams. Two, year, two years ago, I'd gotten out of jail. I'd kind of crawled back to AA. All my shame, all my sadness, all my darkness. And people loved me one more time, exactly where I was at. About that time, I, I fell off a ladder and shattered my heel, and I ended up in bed. And it was just like, really? You know, really? And it was one of the most profoundly transformational periods of my life because it put me in a place of really looking within and really taking inventory. And not inventory in that way of I'm so bad, but that inventory in that way of, okay, I can clean this up and I can remember the truth of who I am. 
I can remember that truth of who I am as that small child that has gathered all kinds of a co collection of stories and beliefs and ideas about the world that I've put on top of that pure spirit. And I can one more time begin to use the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to uncover all those stories and those lies I've believed. I had a calling to go into doing spiritual work for, a, for my life's work, and today I am doing that, and I'm doing that in a really beautiful way, and I'm so grateful that absolutely every area of my life I'm able to live my truth, I'm able to live um, in service to others. Two years ago at this conference, I met Will, my partner, and I actually didn't think that I could ever be in a relationship. Three weeks before I met Will, I told my best friend, I absolutely do not want to be in a relationship, probably ever. <laughs> <laughs> I have walked through being vulnerable and authentic with Will in ways that I did not know were possible. I'm literally happier than I've ever been in my entire life, and I owe that all to Alcoholics Anonymous. I just want to close by telling you a story of uh, the woman who changed my life when I was one year sober. Her name is Mary Helen Brownell. She's passed away now, so I can use her last name. She's the first person that began to speak to me about the steps in a way that were so gentle and so loving, that weren't about the rigidity. I was using the steps as a weapon at that point in my life. I was bad. I needed to get good. And I needed to work the steps perfectly in order to be okay. With her gentle, loving guidance, I came to understand that that was actually the disease of alcoholism for me. And I'm only speaking out of my own experience because I believed that if I did it perfectly, I would be okay. She walked me through the process of the fourth step in the 12 and 12, which was about uncovering all of those lies and those beliefs that I had about myself that were no longer serving me or anyone else in the world and coming back to that truth that I see when I look into a small child's eyes. We meet angels here. And if I can offer 10% of what Mary Helen offered, I can be part of changing lives, my own first and foremost. I'm profoundly humbled by the process that's called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want to be clear, I did not say I'm profoundly humble, because I'm not always profoundly humble, but life's experiences will give me opportunity for me to remember to be right-sized. The 12 and 12 calls character defects a index of maladjustments so much more gentle than the idea of there's something wrong with me. One of the best things I've heard about character defects is character defects are simply character assets with the volume turned up too high. <laughs> and my volume has been turned up too high many, many times. So perhaps the gift of what we might call humility is just learning how to be right size. And what a, what a great gift. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a reading from the 12 and 12. And thank you all so much for, thank you so much for the gift of sobriety and the gift of being in my body and comfortable with that. It took me, I spoke one time and someone came up to me after the meeting and said, oh my God, did it take you 25 years to get to understand that? I said, yes, actually it did. Actually what they said is, did it take you 25 years to get the spiritual part of the program? And I said, well, I guess it did. So it takes what it takes and what, where it has brought me is the ability to be comfortable in my own skin and to look you in the eye and see love. And that's all I've ever wanted. So this is from step 12 in the 12 and 12. 
And this, to me, is probably the most, for me, the most important reading in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it says simply this, when a man or woman has a spiritual awakening, the most important meaning of it is that, that he has now become able to do, feel, and believe that which he could not do before on his unaided strength and resources alone. He has been granted a gift which amounts to a new state of consciousness and being. He has been set on a path which tells him he is really going somewhere, that life is not a dead end, not something to be endured or mastered. What he has received is a free gift, and yet usually, at least in some small part, he has made himself ready to receive it. And so thank you all for the ability to do my small part, because that's all I do, right? We just show up. We, we, we fit ourselves to be of maximum service to ourselves and to the people around us. And for me, that means I show up and I'm willing. So thank you all so much. I'm so grateful, and thank you for my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.